Welcome back to the Two Months Podcast, presented by Pete's Concrete. I'm your host, Joshua Marshall, and uh, my co-host, uh, uh, mid mid afternoon here on a nice Sunday afternoon. Uh, we got Brody McIntyre with us, aka the Closer. What's going on, Closer? What's going on? I was uh, helping a buddy this weekend move some mulch around, so uh, my forms are burning. Yeah. Uh, now I'm a couch, so I'm I'm not moving for the rest of this Sunday. And you've Should been be busy work wise too. Like everything on Instagram, you're either at a showing or a sold. So you're yeah, it's busy, pretty... man. That time of year. Yeah. It's when you gotta make your money though, right? If you don't exactly. now, you're probably gonna have a pretty lean year. Yeah. Is it usually for this time, like is it is it better to probably list and sell in the summertime, Broads? Is like how well it's the busiest time. It's when most most people want to do it, right? Especially yeah. families. They want to get in before school starts and yeah. Or even prior to that, right, getting a little bit earlier and just still have a little bit of a summer break and be able to do something. So, yeah, it's generally the busiest time is spring, yeah. summer. And here we get lots of military and they yeah, usually get their orders yeah. to move springtime. So that, that, that keeps it busy as well. That's good. That's good. Yeah. What, yeah. 20 plus years for you, right? Doing this? Oh, man. Right around 2004. Yeah. So it is 20 years this year. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. It's crazy. So, see. <clears throat> Yeah, and uh, when you just got started, that was kind of when the last time the Oilers were in the uh, Stanley Cup uh, <laughs> Stanley Cup final almost 18 oh, years ago. But uh, I guess as a fan, but also a ho- as a hockey dad and a hockey coach, like what was your excitement of just exploring that and watching that again and kind of a different time and getting to watch this with your kids, I'm assuming. Like you probably had the kids over. If not, they're, they're excited about it too, probably. Yeah, we were watching the game and – Dan said, you know what's crazy is the last time this happened, Turner Turner was in my belly. I'm like, oh man, that's it's it's cool, but it's also sad. And it's like, oh my God, we've been 17, almost 18 years old, and it's, it has, it hasn't seen a Stanley Cup final. So either have I. So it's yeah, it's been fun for sure. <clears throat> and I like how everybody's sticking to their routines, they're getting a little crazy, right? Like you're having Walk same park. foods every night. You're in the wash for your exact spot, same seat that you're sitting in. Can't muck up the routine. I've been, uh, you know, invited out. I started sitting on my couch for the first game, and like Rupper invited me out a couple of weeks ago. I was like, nope, I gotta sit on my couch, man. Same spot, same yeah. beer at the same time. Popcorn at this time. I'm like that so, too. I like right, right. Where, where, where I'm recording this podcast is right where I like to watch the game. So you know, yeah, I think you really got no stake in the game, but. uh yeah, either, not either a fan. I'm not a fan of either team, but you're also. But at the end of the day, it's hard not to get attached to a story, and you know, and also seeing it's obviously pretty cool. To you know, we'll see what happens. There's it's only one game. We'll break this game down. But at the end of the day, it's always pretty cool when you see the generational talent players, the guys that are changing the game, game by game. And meeting Connor and Leon, that you know, have an opportunity and possibly get a chance to hoist it. Like we just shared on our Instagram today of all their guests that have won the Stanley cup and just finding those pictures and posting those. It's pretty cool. And one of those, uh, uh, out of the, I think there was nine of them. We've had nine players that have won a Stanley cup. A couple of them won it twice. Um, but yeah, one of them is going to join us, uh, earlier next week. So that's going to be pretty cool. It'll be a nice. guest, but you know, it's always nice to kind of get a former Stanley cup champion as a player on. We definitely have Craig button and Mike Fuda who wanted in executive roles, but, uh, um, your thoughts on the game last night? Um, obviously, game two is tomorrow as this podcast comes out, and we'll preview that. But uh, I know before we hit record, you wanted to kind of break down those two goals against the earliest start. So, uh, toss it over to you. How do? How was the breakdown? Where was the breakdown made? A lot of people going off saying maybe that first goal was more on Hyman than anything. But where are you at on the on these breakdowns of these goals against that the others gave up last night? Well, you break down two, you get – there's a lot of errors on the first one. The first one is uh, McDavid's F3 and his guy Barkoff swings instead of just stopping and staying puck side. You know, you teach that when you're nine years old. But McDavid's you – know, it's a hard habit to break in a big loop, as he always does, and he's in a bad spot. He's on the wrong side of the puck, 100 and whatever it is, 175 feet away from his own net. And that's mistake number one. He refuses to – play the right way for 60 minutes. It's it's tough. I know he's on the ice all the time, but I'd like to see him. Honestly, it's just stopping there, Bosco. Like, yeah. Stop BF3, be the high guy, and you, you see Barkov. He's right in front of you. Uh, instead of a big loop, and he's beat already at ringette line. His offensive ringette line, he's already beat. It's over. Like, it's already a three and two because he just decides not to be in the right spot. So then he chases. He does a good job back checking. 
it's a, just a solid three and two, nothing fancy. And, you know, he gets right around the blue, Barkov kicks it out. And there's just no need for a nurse to, and CC to slide over. CC's kind of forced to make the next play, but, you know, it's a three and two. Nur if nurse looks up, he sees McDavid's behind Barkov, he sees Hyman chasing the third guy. <clears throat> Hyman's already chasing. He's in chase mode. That guy's way behind him because they stretch. He's the weak side forward. Right? He's standing at the far blue line. So people can say it's Hyman. I'm sure he didn't skate from the blue line in, but he's in he's in no man's land already. He, and he was F2. It was McDavid who was F3. So if it, McDavid's in a good spot, none of it even happens. But yeah, so it, it crosses the blue. They kick it out. Barkov does the middle drive like he's supposed to. And if Nurse just stays dot lane and doesn't push out to the wall, there's no issues, whatever. He can't give it back to Barkov. Uh, and then it gives time for McDavid to get back and Hyman to get, get back. But no, Nurse slides over. They hit the seam pass there to Barkov, who's going driving to the post. And then uh, CC has to slide over and go to Barkov, which leaves back door wide open, right? Yeah. The other part of it, about it is McDavid doesn't take a stride from blue line in. If he just goes balls out and sprints back to the house, he stops gets on that post... He gets so there is no pass cross, yeah. right? If he just sprints the entire way back and does that, but he does and he glides back. And so it's a comedy of errors. It starts with McDavid, nurse slides out and reaches, and then McDavid doesn't buzz back either. So uh, I count three errors on that one. Maybe technically, I guess, maybe you could say Hyman could have skated faster, but it's not his fault. He's not as he's he's in a bad spot already, right? He was already beat back. So he was F2 anyways, right? So it's McDavid's opportunity and his – his response, he, I don't know, he should be the one back there. He, if it was on me, if I had to pick one person, I'd say it's McDavid's fault, which is crazy to say because he's the best player in the world, but that's the facts. So, so on that play closer, so when McDavid's back checking, it would it be a good opportunity for him to kind of communicate on where he wants himself to be so he knows where the where, where those two defensemen don't go to? Is there a way you can communicate <laughs> with the player, like obviously in a perfect world, maybe? Because I'm just saying it because we see a lot of times where. So more or less it's the defenseman where the defenseman kind of is letting the play come to him and he's kind of letting like he's pointing like hey you're getting this guy you're getting this guy and I got this guy would it be a would you think maybe at, at a time maybe McDavid could be like hey I'm getting I'm going to bark off so don't fish into bark off and let the three on two happen because it's a three on two but the chances maybe that being a goal is slim because every t like you're right the way you broke it down is it turns into a two on one and a two on one and then it's pretty much a one on one on on you know Verhage on Skinner. Do you think it's a good opportunity for McDavid to kind of communicate that to the defenseman saying I got this guy I'm going to stay in this lane or is that he possible? He could have done that for sure. You want everybody to communicate in general, but there's just no reason for Nurse to slide over to the wall. That's the least dangerous guy. If he stays in the middle with Barkov. And then what? That guy just skates down the wall and yeah. nothing happens. Maybe shoots it from the wall. Who cares? You know, well, it's, it's, it's shot from the wall, you're going to stop. Yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah. So if he, yes, yes, he should have communicated. I guess he could have. He could have said, I'll take the guy in the wall. You take the most dangerous guy going go to the net. But that being said, it was a really good play by Florida, right? You want to create a two on one on the three on twos, right? Separate. So now you've got a two on one, which they did a great job of on Nurse. They, he, he was a sucker. He went out to the wall. They get right back to him. There's your two and one. Yeah. And they go in and they score. And then, so now the second goal, more like you put it in the group chat, puck watching, sticks not in the right position for Nurse. Is that all on Nurse or is there, where's the breakdown in that play? Because it's a good dump in by Bennett. He retrieves the puck and he originally dumped in and then gets it out in front for uh, Evan Rodriguez. But where are you breaking down this pool? How, how, would, how can this be preventable going forward? Uh, another stop or a better angle originally at the far blue line from Kane. It was, he does a big instead of kind of angling him off. He just kind of does a big swing and loop. It's a skate up right down the middle of the ice. And then he gets to the blue line ish and Corey Perry standing at the blue line there and he chips it in and Perry swings to go to the right wing. If he just stands there and makes him kind of go around him, <clears throat> that gives more time for CC. It's a tiny little detail, but it, it, it matters, obviously, if he was one step slower, uh, CC has that puck. CC gets beat to that puck, which it's not a mistake, right? He's yeah. trying to get to the puck. Uh, Nurse should be going back to the front. Not only does he not have a stick on the ice, his feet are facing down ice. They should be facing up ice. He should buzz back there. 
get Spoppy looking at base, so he knows who's coming in behind him. He's not in front of him. He's facing the right direction. He's he's fine. And if it sticks on the – even if he just doesn't do that, it sticks on the ice. He grabs the puck and helps to go the other way. But ideally, I'm assuming – I don't know what they're teaching them at that level. Maybe it's a nuance, a little different. But generally speaking, you'd like to see Nurse get back, sprint back, stop, turn, feet up ice – so we can scan and see who's coming and what's happening. Now he's protecting the net front and that gets out. It was really good. I can't even know who made the pass. That was a really nice pass. Just getting it out. It was bad. Yeah. Yeah. So he did a really good job of forechecking. And then I think he just tries to bang it to the front. There's no way he was trying to bang it over top of the nurse's stick and into. No, I guy. think it was kind of a right. fluky play in that terms of it. it yeah. Just the way it looks, it looks like it's a really good play. In yeah. So in per, per nurse again, right. He's got to do a little bit better. Yeah. Now going for it's amazing though, like two mistakes, two goals. It's like just like that. I feel yeah. like in NHL now in the playoffs, every mistake is in the back. Like it's a head. goal. It's crazy. Even just mistake even kind of face off plays. And I think out of the teams that I watch a lot, uh, I think the Oilers have more face off plays than and I'm sure everyone has equal amount, but maybe it's just more open to us because we watch the Oilers a lot more than maybe we watch other teams or notice this, but there's so many different ways they attack just on an offensive zone face-off. Like you see a lot of times when they get, they know they have an offensive zone face-off, all five players on the ice are having a meeting of like what's going on. And that yeah. like, it's, it's not a quick drop the puck. It's like literally there's good conversations going on. It almost seems like every player, all five players are engaged in the conversation, knowing that they probably only have maybe 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds to kind of up, to come up with a play they obviously have a lot in their repertoire because we would believe that this team is, is very good and has been very good since November 12th. Uh, but yeah, it's just interesting. Like in that, and how many goals we see off the faceoffs that uh, throughout these playoffs and throughout this year, it's been, it seems to be more now than there has ever been before, but you know, I, don't... I enjoy watching those. Those are my favorite too. When you see a nice set play, like, Oh, that was beautiful. Everybody does yeah. the right thing and bang, it's in the net. Yeah. I, it is. Interesting like when they do see. where, I don't know, no idea what it's called. The one where they went at the point and then make David swings all the way around the net to the far side, and he's got a few options off of that. But that's a that's my favorite one that they run. Yeah, no, they're pretty good, and it's interesting because I think Ner- Drysaddle gets waved out more than any. But he also talked about that in the press conference leading into the Stanley Cup final. Is that he's always pushing, he's always pushing it forward. Um, so he's always kind of cheating. And that's why he's probably getting kicked out. He wasn't really he wasn't complaining that he gets kicked out a lot. It's just a lot of it he said is on him too. But trying to that perfect timing on offensive zone draw because obviously the defending player has to drop his stick first before Drysdale yeah. drops his stick. But uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting. So um, okay, yeah, first... actually, Bosco, I think the uh, the away team has to put their stick down first. Yeah, sorry, the away team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it is interesting how it all kind of comes together in terms of like little strategies like that. And I thought that was a good rule change that, you know, could add more offense to the game. And it kind of, I think it pretty much has, right? So, absolutely. Uh, I like that. Yeah. You're, you're, but, you're back on. Yep. You definitely are. Um, okay. So let's, let's try and like, let's keep with this game. Obviously, um, you know, you're in the chat. Obviously, I, we can probably say the Oilers are the better team. Like, you know, they're, they outshot them, the uh, rush chances. High danger chances were higher. Obviously, Florida had more hits, but that's probably because they didn't have the puck a lot. So when you when you don't have the puck, you're probably hitting more because you're chasing it. But uh, the faceoffs were uh, sixty to forty. So we'll get into some maybe lineup changes in a second. But uh, um, would you say this is kind of a wasted opportunity in a way? Like I don't think we should be panicking. Any or their fans shouldn't be panicking. Like played a really good game. They know that the the moment wasn't big for them. I thought it was a nice touch with the Stanley Cup being <clears throat> nice before the game. Um, they've never done that before. It was the first time they've ever done that. So I thought that was a new wrinkle that they talked that they that the NHL put in. But it was. I hope they don't do it every game. I think it's one time right before the first game is a good one. But the moment wasn't too big for them, Brody. So you know, were you at as level of concern with other fans like? You know that Florida's probably going to play better. That's probably the worst that Florida will probably play all series. They still got the win. At the end of the day, they got goalied. Um, you know, and if you have a good goaltender on the other end, you're probably going to win the game, regardless of you know you have a performance like a guy having two or three goals on the other end. You know, if your goalie stands and he's going to win. But where are you at right now with the Oilers? I know in the chat you were kind of saying some things, but to the fans, where where's your level of concern at going forward in this series? 
I have about a 1% concern because to me, the Oilers were clearly the better team top to bottom for 60 minutes. They got out goaltended, right? It's, and that's not to say Skinner was even bad. He was fine, but the other goalie was all world. And I, I bet you that ranks up there for top, I don't know, 15, 20, top 10, whatever it is of all time performances in Stanley Cup finals games. He was fantastic. How many breakaways did he save? Three? Yeah, three. Yeah. And I, it, I know crazy. they talked on the panel. They're like, they could have played till four in the morning and they weren't going to beat him. It's just one of those games you weren't going to beat a goalie. It's not going to happen incredible. often. Yeah. So you're you, obviously, and that seems to be cons- the consensus. Like most people aren't panicked or worried, but obviously, you know, the Toronto media putting out tweets today must win for game two. That's obviously you know, an interesting <laughs> that now they're kind of jabbing the Oilers must win game two. I thought it was pretty interesting. Chris Knobloch kind of biting back. We, he hasn't really said a lot through the media, but especially last night saying, you know, everyone in this room gave us no chance and we did a really good job in a performance last night. Yes, we didn't win, but you know, we still went out there and played a really good game. And I, and I believe what Connor McDavid said, maybe that's a hockey gods getting them back because they didn't deserve to win game six and they didn't, they were a better, better team tonight. So it evens itself out, but I thought it was good. The referees did good, did a good job. I didn't think there's any missed penalties. The Oilers obviously led, oh. with, led that way in penalties, but I thought there was nothing that they weren't the storyline. So that's good. So um, you're obviously sitting pretty good as an Oilers fan and thinking like we're sitting pretty good here. There's nothing to really to, to worry about if we play. Not, like well, there's still something to worry about. My, my two concerns are of that 1% overall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One, Bravovsky does it every game. They're done. Like, yeah, doesn't matter who they're, who's playing. If he's that good, they're not winning. Uh, and I don't know. I haven't watched enough of Florida to know, like, is that as shitty as they play? Is that, how awesome they play is that normal game they played. So my little bit of concern would be if that's like a shitty game for them, maybe there's seven more notches for them, three more notches, but they're going to be that much better. So I don't know. I haven't watched enough other than highlights and five minutes here and there to know if that's the standard, the way they're playing or not. So if it's a, if that is what we're going to get out of them and that we're going to watch on TV, then I'm more than confident the others can win the Stanley cup, to be honest. From what I've seen, it's not like I've again I like I watched a little bit more, but I think the worst game they played was game one against Boston and they lost six two in that game. That was the worst performance Florida had all playoffs and you know, the record of a six two loss can easily say that. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, yeah, does Brabowski is this like him just dialing back the clock and you know kind of redemption like he got lit up in the series last year in the Stanley Cup final had 11 days off now he had seven days off um looking pretty fresh in that aspect but uh you know Skinner again he wasn't the problem I don't think I can't think you can fault him on anything so you know and I think the big big thing going in was Stuart Stuart Skinner can't have one of his odd performances like he's had in most of the most of the playoffs at least one round he throws out a crap game and I don't I think that's done he hasn't had a crap game since he's taken back over the net. And that's a good thing to look Knocking on wood right now, Bosco. Yeah, you got to knock on wood for sure. Um, <laughs> I'd like him to not let in uh, another first shot. It would be lovely. Yeah, that's, the yeah, time. that's uh, fourth time in the playoffs, seven times in the yeah. regular season, 11 times this year for Stuart Skinner. So that's that crazy. Has, that has to clean itself up for sure. Um, Nurse and CeCe, obviously they went back to that pairing. In this game, they didn't have that. They didn't finish the the series against Dallas with that pairing. But um, and I, I I thought it was interesting as the game went on. Broberg got more minutes. He actually got more minutes in the later in the last thirty minutes of the game than more than Ekholm, which is interesting. There was actually a sequence where Ekholm, ah. the, there was a sequence I noticed last night that Ekholm didn't even play for about a four to five minute stretch, <clears throat> and he kept throwing out Kulak and 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 Broberg, and they kept switching on. They're both lefties, but one of them was – and I know game six, Kulak played pretty bad on the right side. He was not having an easy go, and then Broberg got more of those shared minutes last night. I think he's done pretty good. Does Deharnay come in for anyone? I wouldn't take Broberg out. He's kind of showing himself here. He's his outlet passes, his blocking the shot, his lining up, um, his gap control is pretty good. But where are you at on maybe shifting the D pairings around? Obviously, you're not going to shift Bouchard and Ekholm like they weren't an issue, but it, they were just that one stretch where I thought it was interesting that you know they sat Ekholm for a little bit there and they kept putting out 
that pairing. But uh, mm-hmm. where, where are you at with the pairings here? Just can DeHarnay get back in, and who would you take out? I was thinking of that actually last night. You're not taking out Broberg. No. And he's been fantastic. Well, I was like for a six defenseman, he's been fantastic. You don't he want to lose that confidence really well. has either, right? Pardon me. You wouldn't want to lose the confidence that he's gained for for this. No, of either, course. Right? Yeah. So, like, who are you taking out? You're not taking out Nurse. You're not taking out Ekholm. You're not taking out Bouchard. So at least you Kulak, and Kulak's been just fine. Yeah. You said other than one little turnover, I was on the wrong side. He he's been the least of your issues. So you, and what are you going to take out CC and put in Day or Nate? I doubt it. Yeah, I don't see that <laughs> happening. And I don't know if no, you I, I don't know how you either, right? Muck up the lines, sure, that's fine. Let muck up the pairs, but I just don't see them taking out anybody else other than Broberg. And in my mind, you can't take out Broberg for how okay. he plays. He's been the least of you, where he's been fantastic so for would, what he is. Would you go eleven and seven and take out Corey Perry because Perry only played eight minutes last night? Um, that might be an option. You do that, might, might be an option, or just. You know, change the pairings up. I don't know what what Stair Nay gonna do. He's not gonna give you much other than hit a few bodies and block a couple of shots. And that's yeah, yeah. he's good on the penalty kill, but their penalty kill is just fine yeah. without him as well, right? right? Yeah. They haven't You're allowed perfect. anything with him yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. That's a tough decision to make. Obviously, the thing is, like, it goes back to what you said, game one of the playoffs. It's depth at the end of the day. The depth is there, oh. and it's when you have good depth, there's hard decisions to make, right? So yeah. Um, I definitely think that's... I'd, I'd keep Roberg in, though, just because of his skating alone. Yeah. God, he's he looks like he's a legit NHLer now. That's fantastic. I think he, I think you can safely say that. I remember Bob Stoffer talking about... Uh, he said between games three and four, he went down to Bakersfield with Ken oh. Holland and someone else, and they watched. That was the last game of the year Bakersfield played, and Broberg was, played 22 minutes. He was the best. And they drove back. Bob drove back with Ken Hall, and he goes, "Broberg's going to play some heavy minutes and some great minutes for us in this stretch. If we go to the Cup final, his name will be talked about in terms of that we're going to be using him and needing him. And it's a good thing they didn't trade him. There obviously was somewhat of a trade request that Frank Servali reported that never happened. Obviously, um, so I think he's going to be a player. I, um, you know, it takes these guys some time to figure themselves out, and uh, you know, he's turned into a pretty." pretty great defenseman and it's pretty hard when you play when you're just that seventh defenseman of practice and you get called upon like you're talking about it you know and you're holding your own you're not getting exposed in any which way pretty much almost saved another goal on Tarasenko last night too and blocked yeah spot. so great you know so it, it was a it was a good game in, in terms of him so I don't know I would I would be interesting to see if they change the pairings up leave the players that all played but maybe put him on the right side with Nurse. I wonder if that's something they'll look at. Um, they've never played together before, but you know, I wonder if maybe they put Nurse and, and Broberg together. Um, that's asking a lot for Broberg, man. Is <coughs> and um, you know, and I'll I'll credit I'll credit Ryan Rashog from his podcast. He brought that up. Uh, him, Rob Brown, Jason Stradwick, and, and uh, Jason Greger all on there. And, that was, and what were their opinions on they that? All, they all thought it was the right thing to do, except Rashog. Rashog said, if you, if if Kulak can't play the right side and he's a lefty and he's played in the NHL longer, what makes you think Broberg can do it? You're, yeah, you're, that's literally, fair. Just, literally what you just said. He's like, yeah. I was asking a lot for him to do it. But, uh, you know, they, they asked, like Chris Knobloch got asked today about the pairing. Uh, Mark Spector asked him today about the pairing of uh, Nurse and CC and, you know, Spec did say he's like the numbers we get shows that it's not a good, it's not a good uh, pairing. Are the numbers you're getting different? And he did. He obviously he's going to defend his players and said, yeah, the numbers we have are completely different than the numbers that you guys look at. Um, so, uh, so obviously he's protecting his two players, but we'll see what happens there. And that's a St. Albert guy who runs their analytics now. Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so obviously, you know, they're they're the way they data their stuff is differently than maybe what they're getting from like Sports Logic or any of these other places that, uh, that have, uh, the analytic numbers, but, um, uh, let's transition over to the forward side of things. Is there any changes you would go there? Would you try to get, you know, a right shot center in they, they were 60, they, they did, they did, um, go the The face-offs were 60 to 40 for Florida. Um, so the Oilers didn't have a right shot centerman. Henrik did really good. Um, but some of the other guys got exposed a little bit. Um, would you try to get, 
you know, a right shot center in in Carrick or Derek Ryan in next game? And who would who would you take out? Would you take out McLeod? Uh, my only change I would like to see is I'd like to see keep in dry settle away from McDavid. Because I found yesterday, I know they're chasing the game. They're kind of forced into it. Uh, I find it, it's more back to how it used to be. Like when they were on the ice, it was unbelievable. And then they came off and it's just dead, right? Nothing really happens for another two, three minutes. So they come back on the ice. At least going back to the, you know, one, two down the middle, even Nuge at third line, that's what they moved him to center after they go up there. But I wouldn't even mind seeing dry settle and then Nuge down the as third line center, which I'm, they won't do, but I'd like to see dry settle and McDavid, and McDavid not play together. Sure, they do it after a penalty kill or that type of thing, the odd end of a period or something, but I'd like to see them at least have a one-two down the middle for every other shift. So you're creating momentum and not just having it fall off a cliff when they go off the ice together. How about and you? A, and when you're, I would agree because when on the road, you make it more easier for Barkoff to worry about. Hundred percent. There's only one Barkoff, so if he's got God, he's two good. of them, yeah. If you got to watch that just one line, then that's good. You know, it gives maybe uh, the Bennett line, you know, kind of a better matchup for them. You know, obviously, yeah. you would take. Dry side all over Sam Bennett any day of the week, um, you know. But when you got you know Sam Bennett versus Ryan Nugent Hopkins, it might wash it, wash each other out. Or the odd time, maybe one or two guys get at a point here and there. But yeah, I agree. I thought it was interesting in the last eight minutes of that game. The Oilers only got two shots in the third period in the last eight minutes. Um, so there were a few shifts where that bark off line was out against those two. And they hemmed them in the offensive zone. They really didn't get a chance. There was the one shift where they stayed out for almost two minutes on a five-on-five shift, which is pretty unheard of. But yeah. McDavid and Trisettle stayed out for about two minutes um, in a five-on-five shift because uh, they were spent uh, 55 seconds in their in the defensive zone. And then they ended up – they did get a chance at the end. McDavid had that one chance. That was at the tail end of, like, the two-minute shift that they had. Um, you know, so, but you're, you're asking a lot in that term. So I would agree with that. I don't think the recipe is very, maybe on home ice, it's better. Cause you can get away from the bark off matchup. If you really have to do that, right. then, yeah. Yeah, like if they don't, if they don't win tomorrow night, then maybe you have no choice to do that in your home ice. And then you can get away from that matchup and then you can expose it. And the Oilers are a way better team on home ice. The ice is way better in Edmonton than it is in Florida. The power play yeah. is better in Edmonton than it is on the road knowing it's still the best, but it's just everything uh, is a little bit more better at home for them. But um, when they say they don't have to worry about the series isn't over until you, until you lose on home ice or whatever the saying is on home ice. Yeah. Um, and I do think this is a long series. I'd be very surprised if Florida has their way with Edmonton, just because the way we saw Edmonton play last night, I agree with you. They probably were the better team or are the better team in that aspect. And, Again, if that's the effort you have from the Edmonton Oilers for the next six games, you're going to win this series. Eventually, you're going to break down Bobrovsky. You're going to break down that decor. One thing I'd be interesting to see if, because you saw it a few times last night, Brody, or th- th- thoughts on this. Um, Gustav Forsling has done a good job neutralizing McDavid a little bit, but anytime McDavid went to Ekblad, he beat him every single time. Would you try to attack that a little bit more when you're out with that? Like, you obviously, McDavid probably going to try to do that, but how much how much studying are you trying to be in like hey here's four or five shifts if you just blow them by them and you got opportunities eventually one of the <coughs> teams are going to go do you think you kind of pick on that defenseman a little bit more now knowing that yeah because mcdavid's habit is to go to forsling side but maybe you got to change that up in terms of going to the other side and going after ekblad i wonder if that's something that you would change obviously that he's getting 100 miles an hour stick handling 100 miles an hour yeah. coming in you know, it, it, he reads the play better than anyone, and obviously he's the best player in the world. I just wonder if where your thoughts on that are. I think he'd prefer to prefer to go around Ekblad just because of the speed difference. But to be honest, I, I don't think he – look what he did to Heisken, and that's a top – whatever, a top five to ten defenseman in the world, and he made him look like he was me on the back end. Yeah, I corked. Right? I don't think he really cares who he's going after. He, he feels like he can beat get a scoring chance or beat anybody at any time. But – I'm sure if he's coming up ice and has the choice, he'd go towards uh, Ekblad just because of the speed or differential. Yeah. And I think the one thing about McDavid, man, he looked, he was flying yesterday. Yeah. He almost, I found he almost did, it was almost to a fault, which is crazy to say too. Like that one power play at the end, 
he goes, he one on four, basically he tries to create something out of nothing. I'm like, okay, just, I know you're so competitive and so talented that you probably could do that, but that's obviously not the right, <laughs> right play to be making. And they talked about that with Wayne Gretzky, right? Where Kevin BX asked, I don't know if you saw any intermission, um, but uh, Kevin BX did play that clip and, and played it for Wayne Gretzky because he joined the, the Hockey Night in Canada panel for the first intermission. And he goes, yeah, he's like, you can see it on him. Like, it's like, hey, we're, we're, we're not going, we're going, but we're not going right now. And this is a power play. Like, I'm going to put everything on my back. And we obviously see in hockey or any, any sport when you try to do that the recipe usually doesn't work out in that term. Yeah. Um, you got to use your teammates and use the people around you. So, yeah. and um, I'm not saying he doesn't, I'm just, that was just one example of him. I know you're not saying it either. Yeah. Yeah. Just one example of the, you can physically see how much he wants it. Correct. And how much he's trying to make a difference to win the Stanley cup. Right. Which is a good thing. Yeah. So the pregame show, I wonder where your thoughts are on this. I'm pretty interested to, to get your take on this. So obviously before the game started yeah. on the half an hour show, uh, Kevin Bieksa broke down the travel distance between from game one to where it is now. So before game one, they, were, they, they showed 19, whatever, 19 kilom- 19,000 kilometers or whatever it was. Or um, so, but that didn't count for them just getting there before game one started. So it was around 23 and Florida had 14. Um, where are you at on like, is that going to be a problem in this series? You think knowing that there still is the two day break between games once game two is done. I don't think it will be. Because he thought like, it was going to be a problem for the Oilers, is what Kevin Bieksa thought. He's like, eventually this will wear the Oilers down as a series wears on. So he thinks one, you know, what was it, five, the difference was around 5,000? Yeah, well, he said it was <clears throat> around 9,000 more, uh, 9,000 kilometers more before game one started because they only showed them – like up until like the Dallas series. So it didn't count for the Oilers, the 4,000 4, uh, miles oh, God, to travel gotcha. to Florida just to play game one. So he thought. Oh, I thought it was 5,000 total over that three rounds, but it wasn't plus the yeah. four to get to Florida. Yeah. So he, he thought mm-hmm. he's like, when you break it down and you add the kilometers that you had to leave from Edmonton to get to game one in Florida, that's another series and a half. And he's like, I think that would tax on you. He's like, I can only speak for, for myself. That was taxing on us when we went to the cup final uh, with Boston. He says it was taxing on us knowing that we still had two games to close it out. And we lost in game seven. Like everyone right. remembers the Florida, the Canucks were up three, two in that series and Boston ended up coming back and winning it in seven and shut the Canucks out in game seven. But uh, yeah, I just, I wonder where you're at on that. If like, you know, I think the way these guys sleep and they eat and all that is much different than maybe back in the day. But, you know, kilometers are kilometers at the end of the day, too. Right. So, yeah, I don't I can't really speak to it. No, yeah. <laughs> Madam Devil A is in the, you know, I don't, we didn't do a lot of 19,000 <laughs> clips right over so many weeks and months. So uh, if he says it will, I believe him. Right. He's been there, done that. I yeah, I have not. So I also think that these are <clears throat> the elite athletes and whatever it comes out of the tank we'll call it, i don't know 10,000 extra kilometers is worth i don't know two percent i have no idea yeah uh i hope it doesn't and I, I think it actually won't because there's guys are so dialed and so able to have so many specialists and sleep a little bit more on the plane or sleep a little bit less when you get home or after whatever it is yeah i don't think it'll it'll affect things that much i don't think it's gonna if two teams are even one team's gonna win based on that if, that's a better way we didn't see any of that signs last night they were the faster from start right to finish at the end of the day too right and when did they travel they left a day early so they left early early thursday and they were they were already in florida by one o'clock our time so three o'clock eastern so like they they did early because i remember yeah i was on the phone with staff he was on the bus just getting out of the air off the airport. So I was on the phone with him around one o'clock our time Thursday. Um, so yeah, they were, they were probably even well there before actually, to be honest. Well, gonna- maybe it'll even help the Oilers in that Florida is not used to traveling as much as the Oilers are over the 82. That's a good point too, right? right? So Florida- maybe it'll backfire and be the opposite where they're like, Holy shit, this is a lot of traveling. And the Oilers are like, Oh, I've been there done. I mean, not to that extent, but they're used to, more length of more time, more traveling, more days of getting to different places where they're just a little hour flight and they're coming home. Because you look at it in this series, the Oilers played in two different, well, three different time zones. They played the Pacific, the Rangers, they played Central, 
in Dallas that they played mountain time at their time. And then they went back to Pacific and, you know, the Canucks and now they're Eastern. So um, I know all the games are eight o'clock <clears throat> Eastern, Eastern time, <throat> second and third or third and fourth rounds. But uh, you know, Florida at the end of the day, like you just said, Florida has been playing at their time, every series up until they get out here. So the, and how far you know, is, uh, like how far is the flight to New York? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not too sure, but it's not long, right? A couple yeah, hours? No, it's not, right? And you know, there's less travel in the Florida series. It was done in five. It's just what Halloween Alley that they go up and down pretty much. Yeah, an hour flight. So, um, and then yeah, your your travel between Florida and New York is probably not long. Maybe an hour and eighteen minutes, I would say, probably maybe less than that or more, a little yeah. bit more. Um, we'll but, look it up while we're talking here. Yeah, and then Boston, the travel between Boston and uh, Florida, too, is probably not that bad. Like, I know Florida is deep into the south, but, um, you know, maybe at the end of the day, two hours distance. But, yeah, I, I wonder if that would be an interesting – because once they get out here, they'll be playing in a different time zone here, too. So, uh, you know, they'll, uh, you know where they play, they're playing at 8 o'clock their time, so they're going to have to play at 6 o'clock. So we'll see. I don't know. That That's something to keep an eye on. Maybe if it is something we see fatigue f- uh, fade in, but um, three yeah. hours and seven minutes. All right. So not flight. even. Close. Yeah. So I wasn't even Miami close. to New York. So yeah. All right. three hours. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish up on Evander Kane here. Obviously he was the focal point of the conversation between media and, and the players and obviously the coach today, um, you know, before the series started, we obviously know he's, battling at least a hernia injury what else is he battling who knows there's obviously a knee injury that he sustained during the hit that he gave alexander petrovich uh petrovic sorry um used to be petrovich now it's petrovic again but uh you know there was a hit there he only played four minutes in game six um you know he ended up falling in the bottom six last night started in the top six followed in the bottom six as the game wore on um do you think there's another gear he can get to knowing that we probably only know the one injury that he's fighting or is it, you know, does he have to be a real, you know, factor here again, you know, by being a pest and stuff. Cause I really didn't notice Kachuk last night besides the headlock on McDavid, maybe might've been the only Pretty time. Punch. Yeah. So there was a couple punches, rabbit punches, but other than that, we didn't really notice, um, you know, really didn't notice Kachuk. So if those two guys are washing each other out, then maybe that's not a bad thing, you know, if they're not noticing either of them. But if mm-hmm. one maybe gets, you know, going, then there's the other one's going to have to match that because that's the two guys you're going to kind of compare to in that terms. But where are you at with Kane right now and what he can provide the team of what we do know? Well, what he can and what he is are two different things, right? You'd like to see the non-injured Evander Kane where he's running around hitting everybody in sight, getting to the net, scoring a, a- a good shot goal, right? That's what we're used to seeing, but clearly he's not able to do that because of his injury. So if, if his injury is bad enough, then he, they keep him, I'd keep him back down on the fourth, third, fourth line. Yeah. If he can't, if he can't get there and he can't hit people, can't get to the net, then he's not a Vander Kane. So I'd keep him down and just fill him full of drugs and See give him fourth line and give somebody else the opportunity. Cause it's, I'd love to see him do more, but I, he's obviously injured and is not able to do that. Yeah. Uh, How about you? Yeah, I would agree. Like, obviously, you know, he was a factor in the Canucks series. He, I thought he was really good. He, you know, yeah. touched or if not sur- surpassed what Zadorov was kind of throwing out of. Maybe Zadorov had tilted that ice to his the favor at the start of the series. But as the series went on, Kane got no- more noticed. Um you know, the Dallas series was kind of a tougher one. Like he did have, I think, the one goal in that series. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when Vander Kane is going, he's hard to stop. And he yeah. usually eliminates any players that are going against him. He usually, and he's a good skater too, right? He is, yeah. And he can get to the puck. He can hit. You know, he can fight if he has to. But really, at the end of the day, we don't really ever see much fighting in the playoffs to begin with. So we don't yeah. really worry about that. But uh, I think... I think we need, like, I think Chris Knobloch said it the best. We are not here right now if it wasn't for Vander Kane in the playoffs. And I agree with that. But I think in terms of adding on top of that comment that he didn't say, but I'll say it is the Oilers will need to win. The Oilers will have to win the Stanley Cup if Vander Kane is more effective than he was. Like, he can't be the what he was last night. I didn't really notice him a lot, but obviously he's pretty hurt. It was the only time he practiced was before it was Friday morning. Other than that, he wasn't on the ice at all last week leading up to it. So, uh, you know, and he hasn't really been practicing a lot. So we'll see what, how that factors out there. Hopefully you can just kind of, Oh, 
I think the days off between games will help though too. Like yeah, that, this, this, this is the only time we have a day off, but after that we have two days off everywhere else. Yeah. So. And maybe I, I I think everybody thinks it's gonna be a long series. Maybe by game six and seven, he can just leave it all out there. He's not leaving it all out there, but yeah, push it to the point where he gets surgery after and he's just he's, you know what I mean, full full of drugs and let him go and maybe he can just do it for 15 minutes a night for two games. Yeah. I hope that's the case and then get whatever needs fixed, fixed right after and leave it all out there because the Oilers need him, man. He's a big, big part of this team. He is. I think he'll be a factor tomorrow night, which is tonight because this episode will come out Monday. I think when we dissect game two, we're going to be talking about Vander Kane in, in some good positive ways. In my, in my I hope eyes. you're right. Yeah. Um, that's kind of my key to the win. What's your keys to the Oilers win tomorrow night? Uh, screening Mr. Bobrovsky. Two things as far as that. I like to see him screen more. Uh, three things, actually. And I feel like he challenges. He's way outside the blue paint. So I think figuring out a way to get him going laterally uh, would create a little... It's hard, obviously, to yeah. do that. But And I think also having a man right up his... Like, right, put your butt right in his face, right at the top of the blue paint so he can't challenge as much. And, you know, they always say a goalie can't stop what he can't see, but that's probably the best way to do it. He, he can't stop what he can't see unless he's yeah. you know, hits him. And then I think just going laterally, trying to make him move a little bit more than he needs to and may hopefully give some, not empty nets, but more net to shoot at, right? Because when he's challenging that much, if you're trying to go bar down, the angle of that, that's the only way you're ever going to score. Because I heard on the game, they said he hasn't let in one five-hole goal <laughs> Series <laughs> all playoffs, yeah. Sorry, Sanity, yeah. by the way, but I think how much he challenges if you're going bar down, they're shooting over the net because he's out so far. Yep. So yeah. I think you got to get him uh, either have or both have somebody right in front of his eyes, the top of the paint so he can't challenge, and then try to go side to side so it opens up a little bit more net for them. Yeah. Um, okay, funny a funny thing to end out on. I don't know how I know you're busy today working and and uh, helping a friend out, but I don't know how much you're around Twitter today. But uh, Spit and Chicklets interviewed the girl that did the flashing uh, today. She was on the yes. podcast. Did you see any of that on? No, today? I saw. You know what? I saw it on Twitter. I didn't click on it. It was only like a I don't know a minute bit or something. So yeah. sure, yeah. they were probably saying hello. It was pretty them. funny because for the longest <laughs> time, Wit and Biz were convinced it wasn't her. Like they were, oh, really? like, yeah. At one point, she was on the interview with them, and then she disappeared. And they're like, "That's not her. There's no way that's her." There's like, "There's not. <laughs> her. Doesn't look like her. Doesn't sound like her." And there's like, not even like the sound. But actually, the interesting part of it was, it was a rat. It was a guy that flat that was recording her that she didn't know who flashed her tits. So, uh, oh so, really? Yeah, it was just like a random guy who was like panning the crowd and turned to her. And she was with a girlfriend, but she didn't know the guy that, so she was pretty emotional on spit and chicklets talking about it. Cause it kind of, you know, it, 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 for her, it felt really uncomfortable. So they were doing the best job they possibly can to kind of ease her mind a bit, but yeah, they were asking every single question and are they real? Are they fake? Uh, are Come you, on. are you going to, if you had an opportunity to get in front of game two, would you show them oh. boobs in the locker room with everything? So you could tell it was like, you know, biz, like not holding back, like pretty much everything. And then oh. I think they did like, quite a few of their fans were able to, to check, do a little bit more investigation. By the end of it, I think they were convinced it was her because there's a tattoo on her hand that was the same tattoo on the girl in the crowd. So well, there you she, go. her hair was straight in the video, but it was curly and there. But she's an oil field worker. Um, so uh, but they're going to try to get her out to hang out with them because the spit and chicken crew. <laughs> Is coming to Edmonton for games three and four, so they're gonna try to bring her to the game if she if her work allows it. They said, and uh, and speaking of that, uh, talk to Biz today. We might be doing something with Spit and Chicklets. We might. It's a big might. But oh wow! Spit and Chicklets are uh, they're definitely we set them up with Shattified Salon and Barbershop. So uh, talk to Biz today. So they're all the Spit and Chicklets crew is gonna go get their haircut in the Oilers dressing room where all the nice. Oilers get the haircut because the Oilers are the official barber of Shattified too. But uh, yeah, Biz said he's absolutely down for that. So I'm always going to take care of them. And if that does happen, we're going to see like Biz did say yes today. So that could obviously change when they get here. But if they are, then we're going to, we're, we're supposed to maybe be with them on Wednesday. I don't think we're going there to go. with them, but maybe yeah. our podcast will be hanging out with them. That's the plan. We'll see how it goes, but uh, pretty cool there. But anyways, the fact that 
I'm always going to take care of them is, is still pretty cool too, but uh, yeah. they're in. Um, so yeah, we'll finish up on that. Close or anything else you want to add before we sign out here? Yeah. Check on your buddies. I just had uh, a guy I grew up with, uh, took his own life. So yeah, you know, check on your, and you would have thought he's the happiest guy you've ever met in your whole life. So check on boys, check on your boys. Cause boys don't, they don't share much, right? They're pretty, uh, and what you see on the exterior doesn't mean it's reality. So phone a friend when you get off air, see how they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, appreciate that a lot. Um, you know, I fought those battles myself and yeah. uh, my father took his own life and I found him. So obviously that stuff hits very close to home to, uh, to me and to this podcast, Absolutely. but, uh, but yeah, um, definitely check on them. That is, it's such a weird thing that us guys, us men don't talk, you know, women talk, but we just don't talk enough. And, um, you know, we just need to talk and I pushed to do this today, but, you know, Clay usually joins us. He's got some family things and I just kind of was pushing closer a bit to do this. Cause I need to do these podcasts. They're helpful for me. They kind of re stock up my cup of tea and, you know, going to church today and stuff like that helps out. But, you know, doing these are very rewarding and keeping that momentum going and is pretty cool. And yeah, well, uh, we'll be doing some more podcasts and dissecting some of this, but yeah, definitely great words. Uh, closer there, check on your buddies and condolences to your friend and all those have lost. Uh, we've lost, uh, to this, uh, this, this battle here that, uh, we just need to get a hold of here. So, uh, um, take care everyone. We love you. And, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's keep, keep together, keep strong and, uh, let's lean on each other.